Let's welcome Marcy Polreich. Thank you. Good morning. How is everyone? <laughs> It's so nice to be here this morning. Normally what I would do is I would have a picture of my family up here, but I, I, I'm not real computer savvy, so I kind of waited till the last minute, and as great as your sound man is, he couldn't, um, that just didn't work with it. So I apologize for that, but part of my family is here today. Um, as uh, Pastor Dan told you, you guys are so blessed with your pastors and their family. I, you know, when I was in college, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here. I tell him all the time. He knows it. He was like my favorite Bible school teacher ever. <laughs> I went to Seattle Bible College just so he could be my teacher. He was so good. And I'm not kidding you. He was my favorite. So you are very blessed with a great pastor. So this morning, what I want to try to do is I want to introduce my family to you, as um, Pastor Dan said. Um, of course, Ed, my wonderful husband, in August we would have been married for 28 years. Um, I was blessed. He gave me all these babies. So I have five kids. We have five children. Our oldest was Justin. He came to the first service, and he's married. He has three um, beautiful babies, and we actually have five kids. They are all the J's. So we started out with Justin, Jordan, Jessica, Jasmine, and Janessa. And yes, we get them all mixed up. We finally just say, you know who we're talking to. Come. And they come. They figured it out. So, um, and then our two oldest, or our two of our grandsons are named James and Judah, but they decided they had a little girl, they would name her Sierra and break our J's. So <laughs> she is. And then right here in the front is uh, my little grandbaby, Lila, since I tell you, I am a grandma. It is awesome. I love it. Here she is right here. Would oh, you want to say hi? Say hi to everybody. <laughs> So, <laughs> I just want to tell you about little Lila here for just a minute. Actually, she's 18 months, and she was born with a bad heart. So she has already had open heart surgery. She is a miracle and a gift from God. And she actually goes in on the 20th of December for another procedure, which we are asking God that when we go in on December 20th, and I'm telling you so you can pray, we are asking God that when they go in with that scope, they will be wrong and there will be nothing wrong with this baby and we declare it in Jesus' name. They're telling us her valve is not big enough for the blood flow, but we know that God can do that surgery ahead of time and we can go in and get out of there and have nothing wrong with her. So that's what we're standing on and believing. Obviously, you can see, just so you know, I really love my kids as much as my grandkids, but you know, you know how it is. They like said, if you, if you had grandkids first, you'd have been a better parent. So <laughs> I don't know how that works. But anyways, our oldest son, Justin, um, he was here at first service. Uh, I had him stand up. Looks a lot like Ed. Um, then we have our next son, Jordan. He is not here with us this morning. Jessica right here. My girls aren't going to like it, but will you just stand up? She is our oldest daughter. Jessica is Lila's mother. And um, next to her, we have Jasmine. She is uh, in Spokane. She is in what we call School of Leadership. It's similar to at Generational Hope, where Ed and I had pastored. We had a young adults 18 to 25 group that we've had for 22 years. She's doing a similar program in um, Spokane. And God is really moving on her life. So I am excited about that. And then our youngest is Janessa right here. She's going to stand up. Don't we look alike? <laughs> of course we do. So our second daughter, Jasmine, she too has a beautiful, beautiful tan. And she gets asked this question a lot. She gets asked, is that your mom? Yeah, that's my mom. Is that your mom? Yeah. My dad said she really liked chocolate milk when she was pregnant. <laughs> Yeah, they love it all the time. And then she busts up laughing. She was a joker. She's a joker like Ed, loved to travel with Ed, loves to laugh. All my kids love to laugh. I will tell you something. Dads, moms, laugh with your kids. I am so blessed to be able to stand here today and say, my kids, when they sit around and talk about Ed, this is the one thing they will say. 
The only thing sad about our dad is that he is no longer here. And that is very rare to hear kids say nowadays. We live in a fatherless nation, nations. And like Pastor Dan said, that's that spirit of a father because God is the ultimate father. His heart himself is for us. It's a big Papa Daddy father heart. And um, that's what Ed had. He loved his kids. He loved kids in all over the nations. So it kind of gives you an idea of what my family looks like. I have a big family. They're the joy of my life. So therefore, I'm super grateful to have been married to that man for so long because he left me a great um, bunch of kids and a great heritage to follow. Um, I just want to start uh, also this morning, give you just a brief um, rundown. So Pastor Dan told you, um, Ed and I have worked with World Outreach Ministries. Many of you know Ron and Shirley DeVore. You know them? Keep praying for them. It's just been a long journey with Ron. Um, it just has not physically been himself. And uh, we love him. We love just pressing with him and involving him as much as possible. They wanted to be here this morning, but they could not be here. So just keep praying for them. But I, it's such an honor and privilege to have worked so many years with such wonderful people. And it has just gone down through the years. And um, anyways, we are... Um, we're uh, doing good with World Outreach. You can see, Pastor Dan told, it, told you that, you know, we lost our top three leaders, but we didn't lose Jesus, and he is still with us, and the ministry continues to go forth, and we're seeing expansion, and we are excited. You um, here as World Outreach Ministries, our headquarters is in Federal Way, and our international headquarters is actually in Uganda, where Pastor Dan is going. But we also now are out in eight other countries. So we have Rwanda, Burundi, Sudan, um, uh, Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania. I'm missing some of them. I normally have them. Congo. So our surrounding nations we are in and what we are doing and what we're seeing is uh, the excitement of Uganda starting to be a self-sustaining mission that we're able to branch out in those other nations and see that duplicated and run into the other parts of the world, which is very exciting for us. I want to tell you a couple stories. So if, how, do any of you guys, uh, are any of you aware that Sudan has been in war? Has anybody heard that? So we in Sudan, we have a very wonderful mission. We have a wonderful school facility. It holds about 450 kids. We are one of the top schools in South Sudan. We even have diplomat kids, diplomat kids that attend that school. The government has asked us to help them with others, but in the meantime, the school is not running any longer because since the war broke out, the rebels have come in and they actually have control of our compound and our church, which is also a very incredible facility. Our people that work in Sudan, I think many of you may have heard and Ed may have told you last time he was here, we have Benjamin. He has worked with Sudan Outreach Ministries for a long time. Uh, over a few months back, he was released from prison. He was our uh, pastor that was put in prison, and he stayed in the dark for a year and four months. The man that was with him did not make it. He did pass away. God did spare Benjamin. He came back to the compound in Sudan. We were up in Sudan a few months back. Uh, actually, the trip that Ed and, Ed and Scott and everyone was on, Pastor Kawesa, they came home Sunday night, which was Easter Sunday, and Monday they went to be with the Lord. So they were at our compound in Sudan. I had a one-minute clip this morning of uh, Richard Kawesa singing Amazing Grace, and it had our last footage in, Spoke I mean, in um, Sudan of our um, church and our facilities. And so we are believing God that eventually peace will come there and we are able to go back to that compound. In the meantime, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees spread out in the different countries. We have a refugee camp that is in Uganda, and in that refugee camp it consists of our people that were in Sudan. So 
Benjamin now has spent a year and four months in the dark in prison. He gets out. He's now chased from their home. People have been killed. Relatives have been killed. Family members. They're chased from their country, not just their home. They've lost family members. And now they are in another country. And I loved it because when we were in Uganda a few months ago, we sat and talked with him. And I loved his spirit because think about it. You've been in jail for a year and four months. You um, now are kicked out of your country. You're now in Uganda. And he's sitting there telling us about the goodness of God. He goes up to the refugee camp. He calls us and says, okay, I am not a refugee. I am a missionary to Uganda. Therefore, this is what I need. I need a structure built because I'm going to start a church. And I have 13 teachers that during the week will teach all the kids in this area that need to go to school how to read and write. Awesome. I mean, I thought unbelievable. I think my story is something. Each and every one of us in here has some kind of a story. But what amazes me about the story of these guys from Sudan is that they're not in a place of discouragement or self-pity. They're saying, God, whatever it takes, whatever you want from me, I want to see it happen. So we are right now believing God for that structure in Africa. You will see we will often get structures and just put the roof on and the floor, and then as we get our finances, we build on. But we're praying God to believing two, three thousand dollars to bring that structure up in the middle of the refugee camp. And like we said, during the week, it is used for discipleship because we don't want to just see people saved and just send them off everywhere. We want to disciple them. Okay, we want to save them and make sure that they are discipled in the process. So um, we, that's what's happening in that, that refugee camp. We are excited. There are so many more stories that I can tell you that are going on in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Ghana. There are areas that it's just expanding. And we're so excited to see God expand in the midst of hard times. So it is exciting. I want to go ahead and I want to just, I feel like I just have a word for you, but I want to start it with this. So here I am, you've kind of heard my story. Ed and I uh, been in full-time ministry pretty much right after we got out of Bible college. Um, and of course, I get a phone call that they have all gone to see Jesus. And I thought, in an instant, I thought 27 years, 27 and a half years of poof, everything's gone. And everything that I knew, full-time ministry, Ed, everything of my life, seemed to just hold still. And I thought, what do I do? I mean, at first I'm in unbelief anyways. And during this time, I can tell you this. I wasn't your greatest prayer warrior because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say to Jesus. I, I was speechless. I mean, I, I, was, I thought, this is unreal. I called Ed Tarzan because he jumped from vine to vine and knew he would always land safe. So when they first told me, I just said, there's no way. And during this time, I, I started, I just couldn't pray. But one thing that I did do is I began to saturate my life and my mind with the word of God. When I would get in my car, I would plug the Bible in. And I just let it wash over my mind. I, I, didn't, I was numb. I didn't even know what to think or do. And I just let it go over my mind. And I really pressed into the word of God. And if, I'm just encouraging you today. If there's things you're going through, the word of God is more, the, is the power. Yes. The power of God in you that heals and restores. And... Um, you know, I was, I'm going to start reading here. This is what my title of my message is this morning. Faith under pressure. I'm going to be reading out of the message, just so you know. You, I am going to skip down, but you will find that I am in James 1. So if you decide later you would like to go back and find it, I want to make sure you know where I'm reading out of. This is what it says. So faith under pressure. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. 
You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. Anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. For such persons loyally in love with God and the reward is life and more life. You see, every situation that we find ourselves into, your true colors are going to come out. I know this. I have seen the faithfulness of God. I have seen his healing power and provision over my life. I can actually say that. This is another sermon in itself. I told Pastor Dan, sometimes I have rabbit trails, so if I get lost, I'm hoping he's going to get me back on track. But this is my rabbit trail. I've seen the healing power of God. I know what it's like. I had a goiter on my neck the size of a baseball. I had Graves' disease. When I went into the doctor, he said, I don't know what's happening. I don't know who's looking after you, but you should be dead. And I said, after he talked to me for a while, I said, I appreciate your medical diagnosis, and I appreciate the fact that I actually genuinely believe you care about me. But I said, I need you to know something. I believe in the God that created the heavens and the earth, and he's going to heal me. And, of course, he said, hmm, okay, I respect that. I'll give you one year. I left his office with a smile on my face and thought, I don't need a year. All I need is one second. <laughs> but I didn't tell him that. But I pressed through. And to be honest with you, it didn't take one second. It took years of contending and years. Can I tell you, right before I found out that I was sick, I had, and I promise I'll get back on my sermon, I had a man walk up to me that didn't know me. He said this to me. This is what happens when you get a rhema word, something, and then the Bible comes alive with it. But this man comes up to me, and he says this. Do you pray against generational sickness? And I said, actually, I do. And he said, I just want you to know that the Lord has heard your prayer, and generational sicknesses are not going to touch your body. But you're going to get sick, but don't worry, you're going to come out of it. And out the door he went. Well, thank you. That was just an encouraging word. <laughs> I know I'm getting sick and I know I'm coming out of it, but thank you. You know, but you know what happened? I got that word about a week before I went to the doctor. And something in me rose up and said, but I had a word that I'm going to get sick and God is going to heal me. And I stood on those principles, and I watched the faithfulness of God. And I'm sure many of you have seen the faithfulness of God. You know, um, the other thing I want to talk about this, it says, for such persons loyally in love with God. I looked up that word loyally. Because if I was just to ask you, do you love God? You'd all say, yeah, yeah, I love him. Do you think God's good? Yeah, he's good all the time. I have a different perspective. I don't think things are good all the time, and I don't think what God sees happening is good all the time. Do I think he's God and he's under, he has it under control? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I believe that. But I know this. Love is just not, oh, yeah, I love God. Loyally means faithful to. No matter how hard things get, I am going to remain faithful True to, the one's, true to one's word, promise, and vow. It means steady in affection, loyal and constant, loyal in love through the process. And sometimes processes are hard, and sometimes processes are long. And I will tell you this, I have chosen to trust God. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says this in the message, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try figuring everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. I like it. See, I'm going to tell you this. Trust is a choice. 
and I'm choosing to trust. I've had enough people say, how can you trust God? How can you keep loving a God that took your husband? I choose to trust him. I choose to trust him. It's amazing when we go through hard things in life, how much it changes your perspective. Even though I know life is precious, I even know life is more precious today. And you see, this is the thing. I don't, I can still love my God because I want to obey him. I trust him. I trust that even in the midst of hard times, that he has everything under control. And you know, I said to you, people have asked me, how can you love a God? And don't you blame God? No, I don't blame God. Can I, can I just be really honest with you? For me, I, I feel like everyone always has to have somebody to blame. And when you have someone to blame, you're only hurting yourself. And the same thing with God. It does, I mean, God's heart for us is so good. But a lot of times people blame God or they say, well, God didn't do this and I'm giving up on God. What? I think we have to watch that because we have to be, God is with us all the time and it's not always good. But he still knows. He still knows. One of my favorite quotes that I love is this. It comes from Kung Fu Panda. It's a cartoon. Does anybody have you ever watched it? He says this in there. Yesterday's history, tomorrow is a mystery. But today's a gift. That's why we call it the present. And I love it because today is a gift. This moment. You know what? We can plan for the future, but we only have this moment we're in right now. See, my perspective has changed. Since everything I've gone through, I'm only granted this moment I'm in with you right now. I plan for the future. I'm excited for the future. I'm excited about investing in the next generation. But what I have to give and offer is right here in this time, in this moment. And my heart wants to do the best I can for God because I am passionately in love with him. Even if he makes a decision I don't like. So, in my days ahead, I want to learn how to love extravagantly. Your pastor used this word this morning, extravagantly. I love the word. To count each day as a gift. I want to laugh more and I want to love more. I want to be more patient and I want to be more kind. I don't want to envy and I don't want to boast. I don't want to be proud. I don't want to dishonor others, and I don't want to seek my own way. I don't want to become easily angered, and I don't want to keep records of wrongs. I want to delight in evil. I don't want to delight in evil, but I want to rejoice in the truth. Because it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Because love never dies. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, and love extravagantly. That's how the first chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 is really about. It's not just, okay, I'm patient, I'm kind. I'm going to be patient extravagantly, even when nothing's going right. That's when you have to be extravagantly patient. Okay, so there is, when you read 1 Corinthians 13, read it in a different light, that you're going to love extravagantly. Extravagantly is going beyond what is deserved. Exceeding bounds of passion. You know, this year, um, since Ed passed away, there were a few people that I had prophetic words from. And it's kind of hard because I actually got a prophetic word like this like two days after Ed died. And I'll just tell you, my heart wasn't there for it. And this is the prophetic word I got. And it was from a very well uh, prophet that I know was right on. And he called me and he said, Marcy, the Elijah Elisha story, I saw it. When Ed died, he dropped the mantle and you picked it up. And I said, oh, well, thank you. Goodbye. Put it on the shelf. And the following Sunday right after that, I got that same prophetic word. And I just thought, oh, man, okay, thank you. And I shelved it. A couple weeks ago, I was praying. 
And I asked the Lord this, what was it with my husband? Why was he so wise? And he loved life. There wasn't anything in life he didn't love. In fact, I know this. You think heaven's bright now? When Ed got there, it just got brighter. And you can ask anyone that knows him. He lit up everything like a light bulb. But I asked the Lord one day, I said, what is it? What was it with Ed? And the Lord spoke to me and he said this. He knew the secret to extravagant love. And that's where I heard the word extravagant. And I thought, wow. But he was such a great leader in everything. But he knew the secret to extravagant love. And in the last two weeks, I was before the Lord as I was praying, and I just said, Lord, if it's true that I picked up a mantle, then I request one mantle for me, and I want that mantle of extravagant love because there's nothing you can't do without extravagant love. You want to be a great leader? Extravagant love. You want to be a great father and a mother? Extravagant love. There's something in that extravagant love. And you know, it's hard because as you're seeing, that extravagant love doesn't always, it's not, it sounds really good, but it doesn't always feel so good. (laughs) See, this is the thing. Faith is that complete trust or confidence in someone or something that is not seen. See, faith under pressure will either cause you to advance or cause you to pull back. It will cause you to question why or it'll cause you to ask what's next. Don't lose your passion in your heart that God placed there. Go for it. I want to give you an example. This right here, just so you know, the first one I gave you in first service was new. Nobody had their mouth on it. I forgot to tell you that. So does anybody know what this is? Is it, is this how it works? Okay, so this bouncy ball, bouncy balloon, is really of no value right now. You guys see it in the back? So it's really of no value. But if I give it to John here, he was my helper for service. This one's new too. (laughs) He's going to put some pressure in this balloon. He's going to put some pressure, a little bit more, and when he's done... (laughs) Before he faints, I told him I tried to blow it up once. That's good. You can tie it. I tried to blow it up when I was preaching. almost fainted myself, so I thought I'd better get some help. (laughs) Well, I think it's safe to say you have more air than me. (laughs) So here you go. Look at, and he's even smiling. So uh, the reason I'm showing you this, you're probably thinking, what on earth is that girl doing? Okay, this is what I'm doing. Remember... When it looked like this, it has no value. But when pressure comes, expansion comes, and it's a value. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah, so that expansion has come. This now has value. And we, so this is what my question to you is this. What's holding you back? Excuses, words, battle in your mind, or just the discomfort you go through when the pressure comes. See what happens with pressure? A lot of times we're like, oh, it's pressure, it's Satan. We rebuke you. We give him way too much credit. I mean, half the time when we're going through pressure, it's like God's like, let me just teach you this. Let me breathe life into this. This thing had to have some air. Let me breathe into you, and it's going to expand, and it's not going to be very comfortable. Let me tell you, every woman in here that's had a baby know what expansion with pain feels like. But at the end, oh, what joy. I'll give you guys that for me. Get rid of that. That'll distract everybody the whole time. But I want to just read this prophecy. I told them in first service that I, as I was praying for Sunrise Chapel, it's, it's amazing. My son actually gave this prophecy to me um, when I was preaching. And he said, Mom, I have a word for you. Gave me this word and I wrote it down. And as I've gone to church to church, I started praying. And the Lord spoke to me and said, the, the prophecy is national. I said, okay, I'll be obedient to it. So I just want to prophesy this over your church today. 
You are like a fine diamond being prepared to shine for the world. The thing is, much like love, life creates pressures, but extreme pressure is what makes a diamond. You are going through this season of intense pressure, of anxiety, and sometimes sadness. But in the end, you will be the most glorious and beautiful diamond. The master craftsman, God, takes you after undergoing extreme pressure and chips away the hurt, the sadness, the dirt to reveal the, reveal the beauty of who you are, a shining diamond. On top of that, diamonds are one of the strongest stones in the world. They are able to undergo a beating and yet remain strong and beautiful. They are also the ultimate tool for construction because of their ability to cut strong metal. I thought about it in first service. I didn't know even your building project. God is causing this church to be strong through that pressure to even be the ultimate tool for construction in the natural as well as the spiritual. I speak that over your church. God is fashioning a diamond that will cut through the yuck of this world, the hurt, and to create a future filled with his love. Jesus' name, I declare it over Sunrise Chapel right now in Jesus' name. You see, when pressure comes, one thing I have learned to do is this. I have learned to encourage myself in God. I have, cho have a choice to either allow bitterness and grief to conquer me, I can sulk in depression, give up and quit, or I can fight back because the Bible tells me this, what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. That means even though it happened, and I will tell you this, I believe in untimely death. If you don't, you can read the book of Job. But I, am, I also know this. God was aware of these three men's death. And I know that there are times when I look at it and I think, you know, God could have just set the car on the ground. I mean, I ask him those questions. Give me understanding. Why didn't you just set the car on the ground? I mean, the God that created the heavens and the earth. And if you're like my imagination, I can see God patting this world and just going, Phew, there you go. And I asked him, why couldn't you do that? He could have done that. He didn't choose to do that. And sometimes there are things that we go through that God, it's, we have to be able to say, not my will, but your will, yeah. even when we don't understand it. So let me get back on track. I got a little rabbit chart there. I love the stories of David. I love the stories of David in the Bible. If you haven't read much about David, it's some of my favorite stories. I think because I can kind of relate to him in some ways. Um, David, God says this, I searched the whole world and looked for a person that had a heart after me. And he said, I found one man, David. And you know what's so encouraging about finding David? Is he wasn't perfect. Have you ever read about him? Okay, just in a nutshell, this is what he did. He committed murder, adultery. But he knew where his source came from. He was broken when he would sin before God, and God knew his heart. I mean, he knew, created me a pure heart, but do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He knew where his source was. And I think about the story of David when he went through some of his hardest times. And if you want to read some hard times, David didn't always have victory. I love the story of David and Goliath. I preach a good way on that way, and I love it. It's one of my passionate uh, sermons to preach. But I think about the story in, at Ziklag, and it's found in 1 Samuel 30. And David goes back with his men. He's camped in Ziklag because he had to just, it was the place in between the promised land for David. But he goes back and he finds the camp is totally demolished. His family's gone. Everything's going on. I mean, he's lost it all. And he's found himself in a horrible situation. And you know what the Bible says? He wept until he had no strength left to weep. That's what it says. And I think about David, and I think there, in that present circumstance, there was nothing encouraging about his circumstance. If we limit our focus on the present circumstance, we could fall into deep depression. 
We must learn to encourage ourselves in God. See, because in times of uncertainty and chaos, this I know, God is my constant because God does not change. In the midst of everything we're going, that's going on in our world and all the worlds around us, we can trust God because he never changes. No matter what the circumstance, he will not change. I want to read this. I imagine David because I love this too. David, he encouraged himself in the Lord when he went through hard times. And I imagine, and I'm going to read out of Psalms 34. It says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Wow. See, David saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. Good times, bad times, great times, and terrible times. Even when you think it's the worst thing possible, the worst situation, God is worthy of praise. Amen. See, David said it at all times. This is a par part of the path of encouragement for you. When praise is on your mouth, there will be no grumbling, complaining, and negative speaking. If you don't believe it, try it. In the midst of grumbling, negative. Don't let negative talk come out of your mouth. But in the midst of negative, say, I'm going to choose to worship you. I am going to find good in it. Only if the only good you see is that you're breathing right now. That's good enough. That you woke up this morning and got out of bed and came here to church, that in itself is worth praising. See, praise is a language of faith. If you want to strengthen your faith, begin to praise God. You know, in this scripture, it talks about magnify. You know, magnify means to enlarge or bigger in perspective. When you look through a magnifying glass, we don't change its reality. You know, when we're looking through it, we don't change the reality. We don't make the object any bigger but we change our perception of it. We cannot make God any bigger than he already is. We cannot increase omnipotence, which is unlimited great power. You can magnify or diminish your perspective of God. See, perspective, which is your point of view, has everything to do with whether you're encouraged or discouraged, and that is truth. Perspective has everything to do whether you are encouraged or discouraged. This I know, we have got to refuse to magnify the devil. We've got to refuse to magnify trouble. We've got to refuse to magnify the present negative circumstance. Don't sit around analyzing the troubles you're going through with a magnifying glass. It only causes you to become in deeper discouragement but rather magnify the Lord. Speak of his greatness and his power and his might. Talk about how big and powerful God is. Because when you make God bigger, it makes your problems smaller. See, faith is doing. Having the faith in Jesus means relying completely on him. Trusting in his infinite power, intelligence, um, and love. Believing that even though we do not understand all things, he does. Because he has experienced all your pain. And he knows how to help us rise above our difficulties daily. He does. He knows your pain. And you have to make a choice to trust him. See, we are anointed for living. Everyone in here, if you're alive, you're anointed for living. Did you hear me? If you're in this room, you are anointed for living. And being anointed for living, like I said, does not mean that everything's going to be just great. In fact, some of you might say, how can she get up there and stand after eight months? Believe me, I've cried. I still cry. I cry a lot. I've had a lot of talks with my friend Jesus. And I have asked many times, tell me why. Show me how. 
What happened here? The God that created the heavens and the earth. What? What? Tell me what happened here. And you know what? I just want to tell you this. He doesn't have to tell me. And he may never tell me. And believe it or not, maybe some of you think different, but he's God and he really owes me no explanation. And if I truly love him, I'm willing to do what he asks of me, even if I don't know the outcome. And I read this book recently. It's called The Insanity of God. Has anybody in here read it before? And it's about a man that started out as a missionary in um, Africa and ended up in China in the underground. And I love this book. I love quotes. He has a quote in there, and it says this, when God calls, you just have to go. Even if there's no clarity about your return, you just have to go. And see, if I am loving God and wanting what God has for my life, and he calls me to do something, I know this, Scott, Ed, and Steve died doing what God called them to do. They did not know. They were not guaranteed any return. They were only guaranteed that moment they were in. And they were doing everything they could in that moment for Jesus. And that's what I want to do. You know what? Yes, I cry. I told the Lord, you don't get it. I was growing old with this man. I wasn't done being married. But that wasn't God's will for my life. And that's the thing. Do you love Jesus in the midst of the hardest times? When you feel that he took the thing that you love so much, And just so you know, I want to make sure I rephrase this. I don't believe that God took from me something that I love. I believe that he was aware. And whatever reason he took Jesus, maybe someday I'll know, maybe someday I won't. And I told this story recently in first service. I said this. A few weeks ago, I was praying and I said, Lord, I'm demanding of your ability. I'm kind of feisty when I pray. Like, God, I'm demanding of your ability. Just like the woman that bled for 12 years, she pushed the crowd. I'm demanding of your ability. I want to know what happened to the guys. Show me. And as clear as can be, and I don't hear a lot of clear voices, I heard a voice say to me, could you handle it? And I stepped back and I said, I don't know, can I? And it was quiet. And sometimes we may never know. Maybe I couldn't handle it. But I knew this, God had heard me. He heard what I was crying out for. And maybe sometime down the road when I could handle it, he'll let me understand more. But as of right now, we have to learn to trust God with all our heart that regardless the good, bad, and the ugly, that he is with us. He's with you. Even in the hard times, even when you're crying like crazy and you can't even breathe anymore, believe me, I do know what it's like to say, just get out of bed and breathe. Just breathe, Marcy, just breathe. I know what it's like to feel like, am I even going to breathe today? Yes, you are, because God is with you in the midst of it. To clear, I want to just end with this. So Paul in the book of Romans says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants for you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well, brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. See, if you will just let God do the work in you. If when that pressure comes and it's uncomfortable, maybe you need to stop and say, God, I just want to thank you for the pressure right now. I'm not going to blame the enemy, but I'm going to thank you for the pressure because there's obviously some life that needs to come forth to be of value because this has no value 
you until life expansion is breathed into it. And I think there's some of you today that are sitting here, and I think you need to accept that breath of God that's breathing on you that you're thinking, I don't like it because it's not comfortable. Serving God is not always comfortable. Somebody recently said this to me. If you had to go through this again, would you do it again? And I told him, I don't want to go through anything that I've gone through ever again. But you know what? I probably will as long as I'm serving God. I'm probably going to go through hard times. I'm probably not going to get along with a certain person. And I'm not going to like their idea here or here. But you know what? As long as I am choosing to serve God, those pressures in life are going to come at me. And I have to choose to say, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Because whatever that is, once that air comes in and expansion comes, you are going to be a valuable vessel that can be used by God. But if you're still looking like this, there is no value in this. None at all. I just want to pray over you this morning. I know many of you have a story. We all have stories to tell. And it's our responsibility to make sure we tell them, even to the people right next to you. But I just want to pray, Lord. I just thank you for this church body. I thank you, Lord, for Sunrise Chapel. I thank you for their leadership. I thank you, God, for their love for you. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have placed them strategically in a center location and that your power and your word is going out from here, out of these four walls and into the streets of Everett and beyond. It's going through our nation of the United States and going out into Africa and China and all the other places that are represented here. God, I thank you, Lord, that this is a church that takes it serious when you say go into all the world. And that means from our community to China to Africa to everywhere that you were about all the world. I pray, God, bless blessing over them. I pray that um, passion and love for the world will never die to the next generation, to the next, to the next, that this church will always be fruitful and multiply from generation to generation with a heart for the world and what you are asking them to do. Father, I bless this church. I bless them in Jesus' name. I pray for those that are in this service today that maybe just need encouragement from you, oh God. I pray right now you would just come and you would breathe life. Just breathe life right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. I hope you just received that message of faith. Faith is not just about receiving healings and deliverances and resurrections from the dead. Faith is when we don't understand what happened and we still trust him. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I know there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of things. I love Psalm 4 and... In the King James Version, it said this, in my times of distress, you enlarged me. That's what the Psalmist David said. Can you imagine man prayer? If we came in one day and everything was taken away from us and we went home and our wives and children were gone, our houses had been burned to the ground, our cars had been blown up. That's Ziklag. David had just done the will of God. And the men that he raised up turned against him and they were ready to kill him and stone him. I don't think he could probably get anybody else that day to agree with him, but he knew God would agree with him. He encouraged himself in the Lord. It's probably the greatest, the greatest moment of leadership in the Bible outside of what Jesus did. And he rallied those men back, and God said, I'm going to give it all back. And sometimes when we feel we've been defeated and we've been pushed down, what we need to do is encourage ourselves in the Lord, and we need to get up, and we need to go back and take back what's been stolen from us, from our families, from our communities. I want to encourage you. We're going to pray for Barry and Ruth Johnson today. They're going to be going to China with Michael and Jacqueline. They were here. They came all the way from Shanghai just a few weeks ago to get filled with the Holy Spirit, got on a plane and flew all the way over here. I mean, you know somebody's hungry when they fly in a jet airplane from Shanghai just to come here to get filled with the Holy Spirit. He was running around screaming, the whole Bible is true. 
He was jumping around. You know what? When I went there, I got, he brought a bunch of people into the hotel room. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. They got healed. They got delivered. I finally thought, this is probably not good, me being the only non-Chinese in the room in a hotel on the ninth floor. There's so much noise going on. I didn't know how they woke up everybody. And I thought, maybe I should go up to my room. I've been here an hour and a half. I might want to leave China the way I want to leave China. But God's moving. We're going to be praying for them. They're going to go over there for four weeks, and they're going to be ministering to them. They've just been totally touched by God and wrecked by God. And we're going to see more of those things happen over and over. But many of you are in places of distress. Many of you are in hard places. You, know, you can put on a smile and you can say, how are you? And you said, fine, to somebody. And I'll tell you, when you love people and you love extravagantly, it hurts. It hurt when I heard about my friend Eddie and my brother. I hurt for Marcy and I hurt for her family. It hurt when I... But you know, I'd rather love and hurt and build a wall and a shield around my life. I'd rather be hurt over and over and over and over and over in love. I'd rather be betrayed over and over and over and over in love. I don't know where you're at today, but I've got good news. God's going to pour strength into you in the midst of your distress. And when I look back in my life, the hardest times of my life have produced the most fruit in my life. I never pray for them. I never necessarily want them. But they're the best things that ever happened to me. And it's always after you go through the hard thing that the breakthrough comes. Always. It was when Jesus hung on the cross that the breakthrough came for all of us.